I'll say what I think a good company is first, and then I'll come on to why we think it's important to invest in them. The primary measure of a good company in financial terms, which David um, touched upon in his um, introduction, I, I, I take from Warren Buffett's 1979 annual chairman's letter. The first and most important measure of a good company in financial terms is it makes a high return on operating profit, profit a capital in cash. The cash delivered in a reporting period divided by the capital employed is a high number. In our portfolio at the moment, it's probably 25%, something like that. It's a, uh, it's a high number, basically. Um, secondly, it has a source of growth which enables it to reinvest those cash flows. It's no good having wonderful returns on your business if you are landlocked into a, a very small segment, niche, or geography, and you can't deploy the cash that's being generated to grow the business. You need both of those elements to make a truly great uh, investment. And last, but by no means least, you need a source of sustainable capital advantage to prevent mean reversion. If you make 25% returns on capital and you've got very good growth to enable you to reinvest at 25%, um, people are attracted to compete in your business. There's a perfectly good law of economics called mean reversion, which says that all returns revert to the mean in the end. It's not quite right, this law. Of course, the answer is most companies' returns revert to the mean or average in the end. There are a few companies that have got competitive advantage that enables them to fend off the impact of competition. I just want to touch upon each of those in turn. Come right, take us off. High returns on capital. Um, why is this important? Companies are just like us. People are overcomplicate analysis. Uh, companies have a cost of capital and a return on capital. Uh, if they make a return above their cost of capital consistently, then the value of the company grows over time. If they make a return below their cost of capital consistently, the value shrinks over time. Think of it in personal terms. If you go out to your bank and borrow money at 5% and you invested in Fundsmith for the last decade at 18%, you would have become more wealthy. Right? If you borrow from your bank at 5% and invested in somebody else's fund at 2% return, you would have become poorer. This is not, we don't need to get into um, higher mathematics here or any particularly sophisticated level of thinking. It's a fact. This is, this is the case. Yet, since Warren Buffett wrote that in his annual report in 1979, I would say more people in the investment community have ignored it than have used it. Uh, basically, take us on, comment, please. Um, this uh, um, quote from uh, Warren Buffett's uh, number two, Charlie Munger, uh, in many respects summarizes why this is important. So, you know, I think I've given a similar explanation. Here's a slightly lengthier explanation. I don't know why he chooses this time period or these particular rates, but it doesn't matter. I'll just read it. Over the long term, it's hard for a stock to earn a much better return than the business which underlies it returns. It earns. If the business earns 6% on capital over 40 years and you hold it for that 40 years, you're not going to make much different to a 6% return. Here's the punchline. Even if you originally buy it at a huge discount. Conversely, if a business earns 18% on capital over 20 or 30 years, even if you pay an expensive looking price, you'll end up with one hell of a result. He's telling us something here, which is very important. This is not a theory. He's not putting forward a theory of investment. It's a mathematical fact. Uh, it's important to realize that. And what he's telling you here is something like this. I wish I had a, a diary that I kept from when I started in finance all those years ago, and that I put two columns in each day. And every time in the investment business, somebody asked me whether a, a company or a strategy was high quality, good, had high returns on capital, I would put a tick in one column. And every time they said, but is it cheap or expensive? I'd put a tick in that column. I would have far, far more ticks in the, is it cheap or expensive column. People spend almost their entire effort thinking about whether something's cheap or expensive, or highly rated or lowly rated, which I guess is a better way of expressing it, and far too little deciding whether it's a high grade business that they really want to own that can compound in value. Um, and I think uh, Munger basically um, uh, encapsulates why it's important in that quote. As I said, return on capital is the single most important thing. There's no point in engaging in a business that has low returns on capital. I haven't bothered today because we've got limited time, but we can show you a slide for the airline industry, uh, which never makes an adequate return on capital. And it is just a machine for losing money, basically. That is, there is no point in investing in business having adequate returns. However, once you've got adequate returns, you need to have a source of growth to enable you to reinvest. It's no good having a business that makes 25% return on capital 
but you can't sell any more of the product or service and nothing, nothing for them to deploy more capital into. They just have to give you the, the cash back, basically. So we look for companies that have got a source of growth for them to invest in. When they invest in a very high quality company's franchise like that, at high rates of return on capital, they do a better job for you than I can ever do. I was asked in an article recently whether managers of companies are better at deploying capital than, than fund managers. And the answer is, it's not really a fair question because fund managers don't control businesses. The managers who are in control of very high quality business, some of the world's great consumer companies, tech companies, medical companies, and so on, have a different opportunity to fund managers. They have a business that can generate high returns to reinvest in. They just have to not screw it up, basically. Easier said than done, but that's what they have to do. Um, where does this growth come from? We look for a business that has a, um, a source of secular growth, not cyclical growth, not it goes up and it goes down. Everything has a bit of cyclicality, but we're looking for, for companies which both at the peak and the trough of the business cycle are bigger than they were but previous uh, parts of the business cycle that grow, not in every reporting period or every year, but they do grow over time. And it typically comes from one or more of these things. Consumerization of the developing world. Um, you know, all the statistics on this are clear. When people in the developing world go past a certain level of disposable income, they become consumers. They're part of a developing economy. They no longer spend all their time sourcing and preparing food. They've got jobs in, uh, in factories and call centers and all kinds of things like that. They need the, the benefits of consumerization and they, they aspire to become consumers as well. Uh, and so that's a very big driver um, uh, of, the, uh, of the growth for some companies. Um, but in the developed world, there's premiumization. Um, we may not be consuming more, mostly, but we consume better. Uh, over time. You know, we may not drink more, uh, hopefully most of us don't, but we might drink better quality. We might upgrade what we do. So whatever it is we're talking about consuming, uh, there's quite a good chance that we will go up the curve in terms of uh, the brand of, uh, of goods that we're consuming over time and premiumize it. Aging populations, an awful lot of people look for growth in, in investment through young populations. In fact, that's part of the drive in the consumerization of the developing world. But aging populations are pretty good too. Aging populations have increased consumption for uh, a number of things, uh, and not least forms of medical care. Uh, and, uh, and so yeah, aging populations can be quite a big driver uh, of, of certain uh, uh, companies. Uh, white space, white space, as you probably know, is a term used by people in the marketing uh, uh, and sales business. If they've got a map of, uh, of the world or a country or, or territory, somewhere where they've got no representation, no sales, they color white on the map, a white space. There's lots of white space around the world for people to grow into. I've given you three examples there, eyes. And what do I mean by that? Something like two thirds of the world that needs vision correction doesn't currently have it. They don't currently have access to reading glasses and other forms of uh, vision correction. They will get it in time. Uh, and clearly that will be a source of growth to people like Essilor, like Zotica and so on, who are in the business of manufacturing eye and, and retailing eye glasses. Payments. Um, we're often asked whether we prefer MasterCard or Visa or, or PayPal or Square or Apple Pay or Google Pay. Or, or, and, and the answer is, yeah, look, we've got a view on which one might be better than the other one and so on. But the reality is they'll probably all do pretty well. And the reason they'll all do pretty well is they've got an enormous white space to grow into. Something over 80% of the world's uh, volume of transactions is still done in cash. Basically, it won't be. If we ask our grandchildren, if we describe to our, oh, so our grandchildren, describe them to their children, I would have thought that once upon a time we would uh, get some, uh, some, uh, uh, some material made from uh, 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 a pulp uh, of, uh, of jute, some of that, and, and plastic, and turn it into this note. We'd have uh, uh, holograms on it and metal in it and engravings on it to make it difficult to, uh, to um, uh, forge. Uh, and then we put it in armored cars and transported to banks, which would doll it out to us to go and spend in shops. We would pay it back into shops, uh, pay it back into banks. And then that's how we get into the system. They'll look at us rather quizzically, given that all they've got to do basically is walk up to a counter with their phone in their pocket and pay for something. Um, and that clearly is the future. Toothpaste, a bit like eyes. Um, you know, again, something like 60% of the world doesn't yet use toothbrushes and toothpaste uh, to clean their teeth. They will. As I am fond of saying on this one, if you want to have a, an intimate relationship with somebody who started cleaning their teeth, best you take it up. 
I think would be uh, my way of looking at it. And so, you know, for people who are in this industry, like Colgate, there is uh, clearly a very long runway for one of a better term ahead of them. And there are other trends which are just out there, which, uh, which we alight upon. Um, just put a couple down there. Pets. Uh, if I had to pick one area of secular growth which appears to have a very, very long way ahead of it, it's spending on so-called companion animals or pets. Uh, pets, as any of you who've got them will know, are on a journey to becoming full family members. Um, our spending on pets is, uh, is rising very rapidly. Um, I'll have to update this statistic, so I know that I'm a few years out of date, but uh, uh, in the year that I last looked, which was probably about five years ago now, time flies, Americans spent $10 billion per annum on diet pet food. Um, now, have a think about that for a moment. There are not very many pets that can open the cupboard. Uh, you could just try spending, giving them less to eat. But no, diet pet foods are what they buy. And of course, for diet, read more expensive and higher margin, um, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, 40% of American adults live alone. To them, uh, particularly during things like the pandemic, uh, a pet is, is an important point of contact, basically. If you wanted a, a cat or a dog in America during the, uh, the lockdown, you would have had to have gone on a waiting list at a pound, never mind at a breeder, uh, to, obtain, uh, to obtain this. Testing is something we like as well. People do more and more testing as time goes by. Is there horse meat in your burger? Um, COVID-19 has obviously given it a big boost as well. Uh, international trade, so it leads to a lot of boosting, of, uh, testing of commodities and goods and so on. And sometimes these two things cross over. One of our companies is the world leader in veterinary diagnostic testing equipment. Um, testing pets is very important for two reasons. One is, I said, they're on a journey like their human owners. More and more of them are being given healthcare, which is uh, as good as or even surpasses their human owners in terms of uh, what's spent on it. And the other thing is testing is more important for, uh, for pets than it is for the human animal for a very simple reason. They can't speak. It's no good asking them how they feel and where the pain is. Uh, so you have to do more testing to get a, an accurate diagnosis for pets. Take us on, please, comrade. Um, lastly, as I said, we need some way of warding off the competition. Take us on. So I'm running over a bit. Uh, the so-called moat, one other Warren Buffettism. He says, great businesses not only have great returns and source of growth, they have a moat that we get around a castle to protect them from this attack. What constitutes a moat? Brands are a pretty good moat. Um, uh, you know, strong brands can last indefinitely if you maintain them with marketing, uh, and with uh, advertising, with promotion and with development. And, uh, you know, you will pay more for a brand than a non-branded good. You will pay more for a primary brand than you will for a tertiary brand. Um, control of distribution and supply chain. It's not just brands. If you come up with something new, if you came up with a new vodka during the course of this call rather than listening to me, um, well, great. Uh, but I'm not sure how you're going to get it in bars and, uh, and restaurants and shops because the distribution is already controlled by people like Diageo and Pernod Ricard and Bacardi who own things like Smirnoff and, uh, and Absolute uh, and so on. Uh, you know, this, this is already a great goose. These are, these are people who have already got a very big control. Sometimes it's control of supply chain as well. If you want to compete with some of the modern dairy companies, particularly in the emerging world, people like Nestle and Danone, you're going to have to go and find your own dairy farms to convert to dairy farms and build the refrigerated supply chain and processing. And you're going to have to put your own fridges into the shops that hold this stuff. You can't put your, your goods into a Nestle fridge. So yeah, that's good. Install bases of equipment or software. People who supply things, and once they've supplied them, you are reliant upon them for maintenance, spares, service, and it's difficult to change. In terms of equipment, things like elevators and escalators. Once you've bought a Kone or a Schindler or an Otis elevator escalator, 75% chance you'll sign the maintenance contract with it. That's where the real money is made. Uh, software, people who make software that goes into your computer to run your operating system or to run your uh, uh, conference call like we've got now. People who make airline reservation software, uh, hotel reservation software, payroll processing software, et cetera, et cetera. Once you've got this stuff, it becomes very embedded, very difficult to change and it gives you a, a tank drive. And lastly, patents. Patents obviously, to some degree, reward off competition. They're our least liked form of, of competitive advantage, actually, because they do expire. Obviously, patents uh, expire. A good example of a competitive advantage that you can get with a brand and installed base long after a patent expires would be things like uh, Otis in elevators. It's the world's biggest elevator company. Uh, uh, Mr. Otis patented the safety elevator in about 1858. I mean, his patent had expired by the 1870s, yet it's still got the number one position. 
uh, basically. So we think actually the development of brands and install base is far more important than patents. Just towards the end now, I, returns are persistent. Good companies don't become bad companies by and large or vice versa. You'll see this is quite a long run of data. It goes back to 1966. And it basically looks at companies with high returns on equity, that Warren Buffett measure, you can see on the vertical axis there, you can see the red companies at the top, which are gravitating around the sort of 20%. And you can see the low return companies at the bottom, which are gravitating around, around the, the 12%. So we're starting with a universe of companies that started with 20% and started with about 12%, and looking at what happened to them over the intervening half a century or so. And as you can see, uh, not a lot has changed. The red ones are still very significantly uh, above the green ones. Uh, and uh, that's the case. You know, good company sectors don't become bad company sectors and vice versa. You know, airlines aren't suddenly going to become good businesses any more than consumer goods are suddenly going to become bad businesses. And, um, and they do persist. And it's partly these barriers. You know, the, the, for the companies down at the bottom to get into where the companies are at the top is difficult. There are real barriers to entry. Take us on, comrade. Another example of the same thing. This is the return on, on invested capital for these companies. We've given you this by sector here. Uh, and you can see there are two bars. There's a red bar, which is a long run from 1963 to 2004, so 40 years. And then there's a gray bar, which is the latest 20 years. And so what it's telling you is what the return on capital was for the 40 years and what it was in the latest 20. And you'll see when you look across these sectors, there aren't any examples of a company which has gone from one end to the other of the a company, a sector that's gone from one um, uh, level of return to the other uh, at the moment. You know, we haven't suddenly found that transportation um, was, you know, around about the, uh, as you see there, I don't know, seven or eight percent. And, and but more recently, it's been in the 20 percent band. No, these things persist, basically. And if you look over on the, uh, you know, to crane your head there, you can see what does well pharmaceuticals, household and personal goods, software, media, commercial service, semiconductors, healthcare, food, consumer services. Mm, they're all pretty darn good, aren't they? Uh, what does badly over here? Well, we've got utilities, telecoms, transport, energy, materials, and retailing. Yeah, um, you know, they aren't suddenly gonna turn around, basically. And as it says in the punchline at the bottom on the left there, being cheap or lowly rated doesn't, isn't gonna make a bad company become a good company. It may give you a short-term opportunity, but it certainly doesn't give you a long-term one. Keep going, Conrad. Um, yeah, that's uh, the point that I was just making. Sorry, on that slide. Yep, and uh, I think with that, we are nearly there. Um, this looks at the actual share prices. So I've talked a lot about companies. And I said to you the reason for that, in part, is because that's my background. I came to fund management through running businesses, not the other way around, or, or, or I've just been in fund management all my life. But that's all very well, but how does it translate into performance? This is the MSCI uh, World uh, Index, and it takes uh, back to 1996, as you can see there. So we're dealing with uh, about 25 years here. And it takes the quality subsector of that index. So the companies that they define as high quality with high returns on capital, high profit margins, good cash conversion, and it compares it with the index. And you can see in any rolling 120 month period, so any 120 months, 10 years, in any rolling 12 period during this period, quality always outperforms the index. Now, quality is being slightly handicapped in this comparison, in my view, because of course, the quality is still in the index that it's being measured against. If you subtracted quality from the index, I don't have the data to do it because it's an MSCI calculation, this, uh, it, this would be more extreme. It would be a more extreme outperformance than very probably for shorter periods as well. And I realize that that's a long period of time, but frankly, we are long-term investors. If you're not long-term investors, you are probably in the wrong fund, would be my suggestion. Comrade, keep going. Um, and finally, I think this is it. Um, Buffett, as ever, is better encapsulating all of this stuff that I've been talking about than, than I am. Uh, it's far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a, at a wonderful price. As I said to you, I spent most of my working life listening to people asking me about whether something's cheap, whereas they should be asking about how good it is. Thank you. <laughs>